Okay, have you got any questions from the, um, have you got any questions from the audience? Uh, it is uh, a general question. Um, the topic of today's uh, meeting, as you all know, has been the uh, assessment in various levels of uh, methodologies that relate to life cycle costing and life cycle assessment. Uh, I want to ask all the speakers, how do they evaluate the potentials of this type of approaches as uh, decision-making support tools, taking into account the uncertainties that you all described in your uh, presentations and the subjectiveness that is introduced in the implementation of these methodologies? If I just start with, from a main contractor's point of view, um, not many tenders come through the door where clients would take this kind of analysis seriously, um, to be honest. Lots of, most of our clients are single source clients. Um, the ones that do have framework agreements, that have ongoing projects, the ones that do, say, universities who have, who have a big campus uh, and other clients who have a big build portfolio, those are the people that would really take this type of stuff seriously and really be interested. Um, so it depends on the client and from the main contractor's point of view, uh, what kind of comes in the door as a tender. From our point of view, in our department, we focus on conducting LCA. So we're working a lot with uh, industry partners, but also in publicly funded projects. And when you're doing LCA, there's often um, also the request, can you also take into account the economic aspect? So we're doing LCC and LCA currently. We're doing this in separate tools. But uh, it's getting more and more that people want to have covered both aspects. So an integrated tool that can do both at the same time, like Selector, is for us an enrichment, also from a methodological point of view. And um, of course, the uncertainty is always an issue. Um, we're always getting the questions, OK, you're assuming this end of life process with the current state of the art, but it's probably occurring in 40 years. How can you account for that? So in current state of the art of LCC, uh, LCA, you're still taking today's processes, but of course it makes sense to actually take into account what can be the future development, how might this process look like in the future. So from our point of view, um, this is a very interesting methodological approach and also as a tool, it's an enrichment to the work we do. I think the, um, the point that um, future uncertainty is, is, is very um, a huge problem for the life cycle perspective is, is obviously true. Um, but I think um, my interpretation of that is that we have to have better tools. Rather than using the tools which, present tools which ignore uncertainty, uh, we need tools that, that uh, can get a grip on it. Um, uh, that, that's the way to deal with the problem of uncertainty. There's nothing we can do, but we can't remove the uncertainty. It's, it's, that's a fact. We have to find tools that can manage it. Um, and, uh, and one hopes that they will be adopted and used, because what's the alternative? I think my perspective on this, um, perhaps as a someone from a research association who sits between maybe the academic world and the industrial world is, is to see the benefits of this type of analysis as a, a prod and a prompt. So it's not there necessarily to be seen as an end in itself, but it's an opportunity to create dialogue and to promote discussion, which hopefully will then unearth maybe not the result that you thought you were going to achieve or that you were going to decide upon, but you will at least have had a meeting of minds between all the various stakeholders who are involved in any project so that ultimately the decision, even if it proves to be wrong in the end, with the benefit of hindsight 20 years down the line, is still being made with the best possible of intentions and the best possible approach for that. From your answers, uh, it becomes clear to me that there is a need of, for a legislative, legislative framework to support this kind of approaches and uh, to develop further the, the framework. What I'm trying to say is that if there were not the, the directives, uh, the environmental directives, uh, the standards, the, the legal framework, then there is a long way to go before saying that this is a mature uh, approach to assess. I would include also technical, technical, environmental, and economic aspects 
uh, in the construction sector. I can see, I can agree with you at one level, um, but I think we shouldn't be always too reliant on the lawmakers to make us do things which should be common sense. Um, I mean, you, you could uh, probably trace a lot of the um, inability of our industry to grapple with the mixture of, certainly from the cost point of view, capital and revenue expenditure by the fact that organisations insist on separating their budgets and, the, and so the budget holders are very protective of their respective amounts of money and are very loath to collaborate. I, there are other ways, I think, of, of improving the take-up. Uh, Ralph Moore, Serco. Um, a lot of talk's been um, put today about the selector method. Um, and I think William mentioned about it coming to the market at some stage in the future. Uh, I think first question is when roughly is that? Second question is from a, a UK PLC point of view. Um, uh, certainly our organisation puts most of our work out on a, on a DMB basis. Um, does the panel, uh, and I think as, as Stuart said, does the panel see that this being driven from um, organisations like ourselves and our clients in, in specifying that this sort of model or tool be used in, in future for, for, for life cycle assessment and life cycle costing because otherwise um, if, it's, if it's not driven by um, client organisations one can see that this perhaps won't uh, potentially get off the ground. I think you're exactly right. Um, um, main contractors and design teams um, and consultants, consultancy practices are just great at reacting to what, the, what a client asks for uh, and it's not a problem and we we relish the opportunity to be able to do that for a client. It's, it's great. Um, so the more that happens, it's a vicious circle really, isn't it? Because uh, the more what we want to do, particularly with the building I'm working on, is get this information out. You know, a case study, case study, case study on what we're doing, life cycle being, being one of, of many, to be able to demonstrate that this was the value, you know, so that others can take it up. But it, I don't want to blame clients or point the finger and say, it's up to you, Mr. Client, because, you know, we, we can help that process as well. But yeah, it needs to kind of be driven in the first instance by the clients, and then it will take that natural momentum um, where, we'll all, where we'll all relish the opportunity to get involved. When it'll be available, um, the, the, the Select has been an EC-funded research project over four years, and those four years run up till the end of August this year. And that project has developed the functionality, the um, concepts, and the prototype software um, which is, you can see running downstairs and from the worked examples. So it's achieved a great deal. Um, the exploitation phase follows the end of the project, and that's obviously very much current uh, topic of current discussions. How rapidly that exploitation phase will deliver uh, software uh, to the public, I don't know if we yet have a target date, but it won't be immediate, but, but that is the very strongly the intention to build on the success of the research phase uh, to make something available in, as soon as it can reasonably be done. Do we have a date? Um, probably not. <laughs> no. <laughs> be patient. Okay, we've got another question here. Um, the, does using the tool give automatic compliance with, with something like the, the ISO 14000 series or past 2050? Does it, does it align with, with those standards? Those uh, standards were part of the overall spec of the project. It's not an area which I'm an expert in. I don't know if another member of the team at the back would have more knowledge about the, um, that aspect of the project. Froda, could you say a few words? Um, about the standards? About conformity with standards. Um, my name is Frode Ek. I'm representing Holter. We have made the software for the, for the project. I can comment on both the going to the market issue and also the standards. Um, one of the important subtasks in, in the Selector project is to, to give input to ongoing standardization work, show relevance, show how our methodologies can enhance or form a basis of new standards. Um, today the software, the demo software is very sort of very flexible. Um, it doesn't follow a specific standard, standardized order. You can add a value, and a value could be once off recurring, uh, literal value, uncertain value. Um, but these things 
are things we're looking into also when it comes to taking something to the market, uh, which leads to my next comment. Um, we haven't decided what to take to the market. The expert version, as we see now, or um, applications running on top of the expert uh, module, um, that is something we're working on as we speak. <coughs> Could be both. Anyone wants to develop an application running on top of this? Uh, just email Rick here. He's the consortium manager. Uh, Chris Bicknell from Davis Langdon. I think soon to become Acom, but uh, we are the one company. Uh, the question I've got really is, is an interesting one because you said you came into the UEA project on the basis of the BRIAM compliance and the credits available. What was the, in summary, the journey from being a, I, don't, I mean, it, not facetiously, the tick box exercise to gain the credits mm -hmm. to become a real design driver? And I ask that because it's a question that we have with clients all the time, which yeah. is we get called in for the three credits, yeah. but after a while we try and talk to them about the, the business benefits. And some clients bite and they love it. Other clients just want the three credits. And mm -hmm. I'm just wondering about your experience in going from the sort of the, the ancillary tick box through to the fully involved part of the design team. And actually, as a supplemental one to that, what changed in terms of the scope and the involvement that you have? Because obviously getting the BRIAM credits is a much shorter, sharper engagement than perhaps the design engagement. Yeah. I'm, just, I'm just interested in the story between one to the other. Yeah, um, I mean, it's a very honest question, and, and, I'm, and I'm glad you've been very honest in that. And uh, the honest answer is um, that, yes, when, when the requirements, we saw the tender requirements for Bream outstanding, immediately I knew we had to get, we were to get most of, virtually all the credits. So I knew we had to get three lifecycle ones, approach Bizria, nice fee for doing three credits, and we thought that would be it. And, that's, uh, and, and, I, and I would say that David probably thought the same. Here's another one. You know, I'm just going to do it. The report will never be opened. I mean, that's, that's a sad fact of, uh, of what it is. Now, um, as it, we, we held our first workshop kind of thinking that. Um, and that's that why the first workshop was only with the design team. And very quickly in that workshop, perhaps because of David, I don't know, but uh, I'll give him the credit for that. Um, we, we kind of got, got over that hurdle and said, hang on a minute, you know, this actually ticks the employer's requirements boxes here. This ac actually, there's something in it. You know, we thought, yeah, this isn't just we're doing a report for the sake of it. There's something in here. Very, I, don't, I can't tell you what that light bulb moment was because it just happened. And we then went back to the client team and said, we believe there's something in this. We believe we've got to do this. And the client was very progressive and very open and, and took it with open arms and said, yeah, well, it, we want to hear it. So, and then that feedback started happening and that user engagement. Would that user engagement have occurred anyway without Lifecycle doing the Lifecycle? It probably would. Would the outturn have been different uh, if we hadn't have done Lifecycle? Yes, it would. The outcome has been directed because of the Lifecycle work that we've done and the fact that the client has been interested, the design team's been interested, we've had a good assessor on board and, and it's kind of all worked really well. Um, but you're right in what you're saying. It doesn't happen that often, does it? CEN TC350 is considered to be the uh, basis under which all assessment for building is going forward. So it's split into three areas, financial, uh, environmental and uh, and social. Social is univer universally considered to be uh, in the too difficult box and everybody's parked it, nobody's even looking at it and it's total confusion. The financial side is split into two parts. One is guessing where we are and guessing where it's going to be. Well, actually that's fairly simple. But to be honest, we're having difficulties with that. With the environmental May I suggest, and I'll put this to everybody here for a discussion point now, may I suggest that actually we keep it very, very simple. Let's forget about the difficult bits. Let's just look at assessment of carbon at this stage, embodied and in use, and then take it forward. Otherwise, we're in fear of putting it all in the too difficult box and nobody will touch it again. I, I think in the, in, the, in the sense that the whole industry is on a journey then uh, I'm all one for taking easy steps, one at a time, uh, even though you might have an objective to reach you know, a, a very advanced and um, high level goal, uh, trying to get there all in one go is, is often a mistake. So anything that we can do to try and simplify that, I think is good, provided we don't lose sight of the ultimate goal, which is to have a, 
uh, an integrated approach to life cycle, cover, which eventually should cover all those three aspects. And heaven knows how long that will take. My managers normally uh, always ask to make things very, very simple for them. And they say they, ha they have to do an effort to do the same thing for the customers. So uh, the programmer of, of HPS uh, on the first version, they, he put uh, this huge uh, press button on the application. And um, I don't know why, I thought it was horrible at the beginning, but my manager loved it. It was like, oh, so you do your work, your stuff there, you press it, and you have an output. This all to say that I agree on your suggestion that we have to simplify as much as possible. But now I'm going to throw the ball to Hannes because you <laughs> have taught his uh, subject. I was kind of expecting the one. So um, I kind of agree with you. It makes sense to maybe only assess carbon if it helps to actually apply the method. It's, it's better to only take into account carbon instead of just drop the environmental impacts at all. Um, in a perfect world, of course, it would be much better to take into account other impacts as well because um, carbon is only one piece of the picture, so you're not painting the entire picture. Um, it would be good to take into account more environmental impact categories, but then again, we're having different uh, sustainability assessment schemes. Some tell you which uh, categories to use, some don't tell you, some say just describe which ones you're using. So there's no really uh, common opinion on what should be in there and what shouldn't be in there, what is optional, what can be neglected. Um, I would say, basically, if, if it helps the application, it makes sense to start slow and then maybe carbon. The thing is, carbon is, is currently, uh, the well, everybody's talking about carbon emissions in the last couple of years. A couple of years ago, it was uh, the hole in the ozone layer. Before that, it was acid rain. So. That we're talking about carbon now doesn't mean that we will be talking about carbon in 10 years and 20 years. So it makes sense to take into account also other impact categories and at least to keep them in mind and to do an assessment. But if it helps the application, it probably makes sense to, to focus on carbon at this point. Um, I think carbon is a very rough measure. It doesn't take into account things like biodiversity. You can't measure biodiversity by measuring carbon and you miss out a lot of things. And I don't see why people have such difficulty with the social side of, uh, of uh, sustainability. It's just about people and how your development affects people. It's linked to the environmental and the social and the economic. I mean, if people benefit economically and uh, socially and environmentally, then surely it's a good thing. Stuart, you mentioned um, soft landings earlier. Um, do, am I right in thinking that you're, you're using BIM for, for this, for this um, approach? And, and if so, how are you integrating the, the life cycle, the life cycle approach in, in, into BIM if you're using it? Yes, and no idea. <laughs> <laughs> the, um, I mean, yes, from the outset we said we would be using BIM. Um, we knew that was obviously coming, this was a year ago. Uh, the architects and the design team, being Archetype and BDP, as the two main players there, two big uh, companies, as you can imagine, very versed in 2D, 3D BIM, so that's no problem. Uh, we committed ourselves uh, to doing 4D BIM to be able to put the program into it. We, as Morgan Sindel, uh, have only got uh, a couple of guys in the whole group who kind of think they know how to do that. But the idea is that that's not a hurdle. Uh, and last week we had meetings with the BIM team to try and put this together and see how it's going to work. Naturally, if you can put that type of data in, then you can put the environmental data in as well. Um, so that will come and we'll see and we'll see how it works on this project. Uh, we probably will fail at doing that, but that's a lesson that we can put out as a case study and say this is as far as we got and this is where the blockers were. We, we were, just didn't know. And that will be a value to the industry to be able to say, well, let's try and fill that hole. Um, so yes, we're going to use BIM. Yes, we're going to try and do it as best we can. Not quite certain how we're going to do that. Soft landings, yeah, we're using soft landings, uh, all five stages of soft landings. We're switching from DQI one and two, stages one and two, to the soft landings to run that all the way through. Um, and in the soft landings, we're aligning the gateways in soft landings, the reality checking process with gateways in BIM. So the idea is to try what the industry is talking about, to try and do it on this job. And if it doesn't work, to then raise our hand and say, this is where we believe the hurdles are. 
schemes that have actually achieved what you're doing are refreshingly going to be observed by others and improved and implemented differently because it all depends on the subject matter, where in the geography it's un being undertaken and what resources are available. Mm -hmm. And so if you're, you're, I think it's great. First of all, there isn't a single answer. Mm -hmm. And it shouldn't be um, life cycle costing unless you put estimating on the back of it. Because there isn't a one answer, there's a range of answers depending on what the objectives are and what the questions are. Uh, but, and that's why it's a great tool, and that's why I think it's got, object, it's got possibilities to be used for all sorts of industries. Unfortunately, there aren't many industries that have got a long-term plan, and that's where it falls short. But that's not a question, but thank you. <laughs> thank you ever so much. Well, um, perhaps that's a fitting point in which to um, draw the discussion from the panel to a close. Could I first just ask uh, the audience to um, recognise the efforts of the speakers who are landing? Thank you all. Okay, um, I've got to sum up the day um, in 15 minutes or less. Um, I think the good news is it's probably going to be all less. <laughs> um, the intention of the day was actually to give you the basics of what life cycle costing, life cycle analysis are, uh, give you some instances of implementation in terms of practical case studies. Uh, I hope that you've actually um, gone away from, or will go away from this meeting having been satisfied in those two objectives, that you now understand a lot more about the principles of life cycle costing analysis uh, and what it means in terms of implementation. Um, I've certainly learned an awful lot by listening to the speakers. I've learned a lot as well. Um, by listening to the, the, the questions from the audience. I think some of them have been um, very insightful as to some of the issues associated with life cycle costing and analysis, which um, uh, uh, some of the, the areas that do need to be addressed mo moving forward. Um, I've, I've been entertained as well. Um, uh, there was a reference to um, multi-headed clients, which I thought was great. Um, the good, the bad, and the ugly, which, um, yes, is a great movie. and. Uh, does happen in the industry. There was a delegate referring to 20 questions, uh, which I thought was, was um, we almost got there in the end as well. Uh, and there was the Magnificent Seven. And I thought what I would do is try and pull out seven of the um, outcomes from today that, that occurred to me. So um, I'm, I'm sorry if I don't cover everyone's pet topic. And I'm sorry from the point of view of the audience that I'm not going to cover um, everything I'm sure that's, that's uh, occurred to you. But I'm, I'm sort of doing this on the hoof, so you'll... Um, um, just give me some forbearance. Um, the first point that came across to me about life cycle analysis and life cycle costing is that this is an evolving area. We're not there with a very mature technology. It is something that will develop over time. Uh, we've got tools at the moment. We've got some tools in development. They all help. Uh, I actually think that in many ways the, the biggest single lesson for me about the um, life cycle costing and assessment is that implementing those tools is less about getting an actual answer and more about taking the client and the consultants through the process of identifying what's important to the client and what the solutions should be. So that, that's the first one. Um, the second is that it's ever so important, I think, that we identify what the, the business case is uh, for implementing life cycle costing and life cycle assessment. If we don't do that, uh, just suggesting it to a client, we're not going to get very far. So this ha all has to be grounded in, in the um, in the land of the living in terms of what people actually want and why they want it. And there were lots of instances of why it's not just about cost, uh, but it's about functionality, it's about performance, it's about impact. All these issues will need to be addressed when it comes to addressing life cycle costing and life cycle assessment with, with clients. Um, I think as well, I, 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 perhaps this is a repeat of the, the very first one, but I had to make up seven points to tie in with the Magnificent Seven. Um, but I actually think that uh, the tools that uh, have been um, uh, presented today are very important in terms of helping the client and others understand essentially what the life cycle thinking that they should be adopting is. Uh, to me, there's much about changing the culture of construction and the way we see projects and what should be done as they are about, say, giving us um, hard numbers. And there were certainly plenty of those numbers um, on, on, on display today. Uh, Conscious that, say, LCA, um, life cycle costing um, changing, 
Um, I'm personally very supportive of moving from the, um, what used to be a, sim uh, a single number produced by software, deterministic approach, I think it was referred to, uh, to a more probabilistic approach where you'll give people a range of numbers reflecting the degree of uncertainty. I think that's in inherently going to be the case. Uh, I think as well very supportive of the idea of having tools which allow people to begin to predict what the impact of future changes to the building might be. Uh, the issue here for me is simply one of, well, how do you package all this and explain it to clients in a way that gets them on board and you know, accepting what the outputs are? Uh, the fourth item I've got um, came from the audience. Uh, although the data might exist for things like um, the door entry system, um, I'm not altogether um, confident that context-relevant information is available all across Europe and all across the areas where people actually um, want it. And I think that's partly the fact that, the fact that there hasn't been a, a great market um, for this information in the past. Um, in other words, people aren't being prepared to pay for it or for, pay for it to be collected. Uh, I think as well it just reflects the fact that in part the world changes so quickly. So um, I have done some work with the Housing Association that's now decided not to buy a particular type of condensing boiler because they know it only lasts six months. They'll now go for one that lasts three or four years before the... Um, uh, you know, the elements and the, occup the occupants manage to destroy it, and I think that's great. Uh, the challenge is, of course, those models change every two or three years, so you're never quite sure whether the same numbers apply to new products as, as they come through. Again, a sense of how we deal with uncertainty, and there was a fair degree of that within the um, pres uh, presentations we've received. Um, I'm also, I think, uh, the fifth um, key outcome uh, for me is uh, the, the power that's, that's there in the selector model. Um, and, and again, as I say, I think it's a question really of uh, the, the tools that are being developed are very powerful. They, they, they potentially can be um, manipulated to give all sorts of information. Uh, they can certainly give a hell of a lot of numbers, which um, people, people showed. And again, there's a sense of how can we actually make sure that we utilize that, um, allow clients and uh, consultants to actually use that power that comes from these, tool, these tools. And then the, the final one uh, is... Uh, again, it's one, one, one that came out from the audience discussion. Um, in terms of life cycle assessment, should we go for a simplified approach to life cycle assessment simply to limit the degree of complexity that we're bombarding people with, to allow them to make fairly simple decisions, uh, first of all, and then maybe make it more complex as time goes on? Um, or on the other hand, uh, is it a case that actually if you adopt the view that says that life cycle assessment tools are about making people think and think through what their implications are, then perhaps that would say, well, actually, you want to make people think about a whole host of issues, not just carbon, not just energy. I think it's a balance there, and I'm, I'm not sure what the, um, the answer is. So I'd like to um, begin where I uh, finish, where I began, um, by thanking you all for coming. I know it's all been a day out of your diaries, and I know that's very valuable. I'd like to thank all the speakers once again for coming, some of whom came from quite some distance away. And I'd like to thank the uh, European Commission for its funding the Selector Project, which has allowed this uh, activity to take place. Final, final um, request, please, 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 can you fill in your questionnaire uh, before you go? Safe journey home.